الله ربنا هو الاله له من الاسماء ما اصطفاه الواحد الحي كذا المليك والملك المالك لا شريك الله ربنا هو الاله له من الاسماء ما اصطفاه الواحد الحي كذا المليك أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن بسم الله الرحمن الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد 
والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected elders, scholars, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah In our discussion about the rituals of Hajj we said that it is a once in a lifetime experience and therefore it has the power to transform and change our lives and it becomes wajib obligatory not on everyone but only on those who are able and capable able physically capable financially and of course th there is no restriction about traveling but in order to ensure that the procedure by which the Hajj is performed is a valid one we need to make sure that we follow the true teachings of the the Holy Prophet as explained through the Holy Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and then we looked into the recommendations of staying in Medina and the challenges that we may face in Jannatul Baqir so now we are ready to start the journey from Medina to go to Mecca for the first part of Hajj. We said that Hajjatul Islam is made up of two basic parts, the smaller Hajj and the bigger Hajj. Hajjatul Islam is the name given to the once in a lifetime wajib Hajj that has to be performed. If you're performing it for a second time, which is mustahab therefore it's no longer called hajjatul islam it is hajj definitely recommended but it is no longer that wajib once in a lifetime hajjatul islam nevertheless the name is different but the procedure is the same so it is made up of two parts the smaller hajj known as umrah umrah to tamattu' and the bigger hajj known as hajj tamattu' we shall start with the smaller hajj first which is the umrah to tamattu' It is made up of five basic components. Number one is to enter into a state of ihram, but at a specifically designated place known as the miqat. And once we are in the state of ihram, certain restrictions will begin to apply to us, just like they apply to us once we say takbiratul ihram in salah, and once we make the niyyah in the fajr in the holy month of Ramadan for the sake of fasting, the nine items become haram in the state of fasting in uh, the state of ihram then we travel from the miqat we go to masjid al-haram and uh, once we reach masjid al-haram then there are certain wajibat to be performed there one of them is the tawaf around the kaaba so we will look into the details of that and on completion of the tawaf then there is the two rak'ah salah behind maqam ibrahim known as salat al tawaf and then the fourth wajib act for the smaller pilgrimage is the sa'i between safa and marwa seven rounds beginning from safa ending at marwa and finally the the termination of the smaller pilgrimage umrah to tamattu' is by the act of taqseer so let's look into the details of each of these wajib acts the first one is 
miqat. Miqat by definition is a specifically designated place by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, of course by guidance from revelation from God that this is the place where ihram is allowed where a person is allowed to enter into the state of ihram meaning that it is wajib to enter into ihram at this place only you can't do it before this place you can't do it after this place you can't do it before this place because you, you're not allowed to uh, pray Salat al-Dhuhr before noon time the waqt of Salah is fixed so also the miqat of the ihram is fixed you can't enter into ihram before that designated place and in case if you pass that place without ihram deliberately then you must return back to that miqat to enter into the state of ihram the interesting thing about uh, the Miqat is that there are about nine places, it's not only one fixed place. So the Kaaba can be approached from all over the world from different entry points, gateways. So Zul Hulayfa or Masjid Shajara is for those who are proceeding from Medina. Medina is to the north of uh, Mecca. Or somebody wants to come from Iraq, there is a miqat known as Wad al Aqiq. Or somebody from Syria or Egypt or North Africa, there is a place known as Juhfa. Or for Yemen, there is Yalamlam. Or for Ta'if, there is Qarn al Manazil. Or Adn al Hil, for those who are already very near Mecca or inside Mecca. And then there is another parallel rule which only applies to those for some reason who have failed to pass by any one of these designated places. So they are allowed to pass by a parallel place which is equivalent. But the important thing to note is this. We are, allowed, we are only allowed to enter into Ihram from this designated place. But there is not one entry point. Meaning that people from all parts of the world don't have to take the trouble all of them coming to one entry point everyone according to his own convenience from different parts of the world can pass through an appropriate miqat the number of entry points and the paths and the routes to reach God are multiple everyone according to their convenience but the important thing of course is we should not cross the miqat Without ihram, we must enter into ihram only at the miqat and not before and not after. And in case if we pass, we must return. So, because inshallah we will be beginning our journey from Medina, therefore the miqat we will go to is Dhul Hulayfa, which is just outside Medina, old Medina. Medina is now expanding. The old Medina, it was about 12 kilometers away from. Masjid al Nabawi, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Um, in case if you're interested to know why is this miqat known as Masjid Shajara? Shajara means a tree. Dhul Hulayfa, Halfa is also the name of a tree. There used to be, it was a wide open desert. So, because there was a tree of this particular name, the place has been named as Dhul Hulayfa. But of all the nine miqats, the interesting thing is, this is the best. Qanini, Qusababu, the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa entered into ihram from Masjid Shajara at Dhul Hulayfa. Not once, but on three occasions, twice for Umrah and once for Hajj. In the seventh year of Hijrah, and then again in the eighth year of Hijrah, he went into ihram at Masjid Shajara. And finally, of course, for the wajib, uh, Hajjatul Wida'ah, he entered into Ihram once again in the 10th year of Hijrah at the Dhul Hulayfa. And subsequently, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt who had adopted Medina as their homeland, unless they were forced to migrate away from Medina to Samarra or to Kazimain or to Khurasan. But so long as they lived in Medina, they also used the Miqat of Masjid Shajara. And the wives of the Holy Prophet also carried on the Sunnah 
of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Why is the rule so strict about Miqat? The Imam Alayhi Salaam says, Man ahrama qabla al miqat fala ihram lah. You enter into ihram before the miqat. Sorry, this is a batil ihram. There's a fixed place out in the desert, not even in the city. I want to do it in a holy place, Masjid al Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. No. Are you better than the Prophet? The Prophet lived in Medina, did not do it in Medina or in Masjid al Nabi. He went out. Kwanini. Or the other rewai says, La yujawiz al mawaqita illa wa huwa muhrim. You're not allowed to pass through the miqat unless you're already into the state of ihram, otherwise, come back. The ihram is necessary because we are now going to enter the haram, which is outside the city of Mecca. And then we will enter the city of Mecca. And then we will enter Masjid al Haram. And then we will engage in tawaf. The meeting, final meeting, is going to take place a very far distance away. It's almost about 400 something kilometers away from Medina. Yet 400 kilometers away, I need to be in a state of readiness and preparation for that final meeting. This is a specific spiritual discipline uh, to, abandon, to adopt. In the uh, Riwayah of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam to Shibli when he asks him, Shibli, did you uh, did you travel to the Miqat when you started your Hajj? And Shibli said yes. So Imam said, when you went to the Miqat, did you make the near that you have begun your journey from a state of disobedience and sinfulness? to a state of obedience. Before you meet the Lord, you have to prepare yourself to stop willfully sinning. You have to prepare yourself to willfully comply and obey and carry out your duties from God. And that needs preparation, that needs time. Did you do that preparation by going to the Miqat? That's the spirit of going to the Miqat. So I may be negligent, I may be carefree, I may be heedless, I may be mindless, doing whatever I want, but no longer. This trip, this journey and trip is a specific spiritual ritual journey which has the potential to transform us spiritually. The requirement is our niya, our determination to become pure. So now we've gone to the Miqat, insha'Allah, and we want to enter into the state of Ihram so that I can become a guest of God and allowed into the presence of God. There's a specific procedure to be followed. Three actions are wajib. There's a dress of Ihram that has to be worn. Uh, and after wearing the dress, there's a niya to be made that I'm entering into Ihram for what purpose, whether, whether it's Hajj or whether it's Umrah. And then I have to declare my entry into Ihram by reciting the Talbiyah, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. So let's look into the details of these three actions. Action number one is the dress. Of course, you can't wear the wajib ihram dress unless you have undressed and removed your daily normal uh, stitched clothing and mustahab not wajib before wearing your ihram dress clean your body and remove the excess hair for example and then after that wash by making ghusl mustahab ghusl for ihram at the miqat and then pray salah either wajib salah or mustahab salah before ihram but these are all mustahabbat. You can, you can go to miqat at any time other than the time of salah and not pray the wajib salah because you're not there in the maghrib or in the zuhur or in the fajr. You went any time in between. Mustahab to pray two salah rak'ah for ihram. You can decide to skip it. It's just for the sake of thawab. So once you have done these mustahabbat, then 
uh, your body is ready, it's cleaned, it's washed, and now you want to wear the dress. So there are two pieces of dress for men, the unstitched two pieces of dress. Is there any specific uh, manner in which this dress has to be worn? Uh, start from the right, then close on the left, and then put on the uh, shoulder cloth? No, there is no specifically specified procedure. Basically, you have to cover parts of your body, the lower part with the loin cloth, and the upper part of the body with the shoulder cloth. So long as the wajib portions are covered, that's enough. So what are we supposed to cover? F with the loin cloth for the males, sorry, for the females, the uh, stitch clothing is allowed and no need for two pieces. Ihtiyat, yes, according to some Mushtad, you should have two pieces uh, of unstitched dress. Um, the normal stitch dressing, which is the necessary wajib hijab, that can become the ihram. But there are some rules about those dresses. We'll come to that. So the, for the males, the loin cloth should be big enough, opaque enough, to be able to cover from the navel till the knee. That is wajib. The shoulder cloth should be able to cover wajib. The shoulders, the arms, the chest and the back. Wajib. Mustahab, yes. A little above the navel for the loin cloth. A little below the knee for the loin cloth up till the ankle. For the shoulder cloth, yes, it should be wide enough, flowing, flowing enough till it reaches uh, the start of the loin cloth and below. So I'm supposed to cover, is there any restriction or requirement about the type of cloth I'm allowed to use for covering myself? Yes, it should not be made of silk, it should not have golden uh, embellishments. It should not be from the wild animal whose meat is haram from their skin. Preferably, but not wajib, preferably it should be from cotton. In fact, if you look at these requirements, they resemble the requirements for salah. The riwayah says, كُلُّ ثَوْبٍ تُصَلِّي فِيهِ فَلَا بَأْسَ أَن تُحْرِمَ فِيهِ Whatever is your dress for salah is the same dress as your ihram. If salah is an ibadah, to enter into the state of ihram is ibadah. And therefore, when you're taking out your normal stitch dress, qurbatan ilallah. When you make the ghusl, qurbatan ilallah. When you wear the two pieces of dress, qurbatan ilallah. Because this is an act of ibadah. So I've worn the shoulder cloth for the gents. Am I allowed to create a button into it? No, not allowed. So then uh, should it flow loosely or should I fold it the right side on the left shoulder and the left side on the right shoulder? It's your wish. You can allow it to flow or you can fold it. It's your wish. But you can fasten it with a pin allowed. Some mushtahs, Marhum Ayatollah Gul Paigani, said, No, you're not allowed to do that. So, at the time of entering into Ihram in the Miqat, I have to wear the shoulder cloth, cover the upper part of my body, wear the loin cloth, cover the lower part of my body. And I've made the niyyah and I've recited the talbiyah. Now I'm into Ihram. I'm coming out of Masjid Shajara the Miqad. I'm now on my journey. I'm proceeding to Masjid Al Haram. On this trip, throughout the state of Ihram, should I constantly wear the two pieces? No, it's not required. So if I wish to visit the washroom, I can take off the shoulder cloth, the loin cloth. I want to rest in the bus or elsewhere, I can remove the shoulder cloth. No, I am in ihram. I'm supposed to be wearing the dress, but not constantly wajib. Wajib was 
in the Miqat at the time when I was entering into the state of Ihram. I'm allowed to change. I wore those two pieces. It became dirty or it's a bit uncomfortable. I want to wear another piece. No problem. So long as the same requirements of the type of cloth is there, that it is going to cover the upper part or the lower part, and it's of cotton, for example, no problem. You can wear a third piece. If I have decided to change and wear a third piece, not the original two pieces in which I went into a haram, once I arrive in al Haram and go for tawaf, should I wear again those two original pieces? Yes, mustahab, not wajib, mustahab. You are supposed to do tawaf with the proper ihram, whether it's the same two pieces you wore to begin with or you decided to change, no problem. Some people are unaccustomed and unfamiliar with wearing a loose loin piece of cloth and they're worried about covering the private parts. So they sometimes inquire, are we allowed to have an extra piece of small dress to cover our private parts? Um, so long as it's unstitched, no problem. How many pieces of uh, cloth? You said basic is two minimum pieces, the shoulder cloth and the loin cloth. No, you can wear three pieces if you feel a bit cold. You can carry a third piece and a fourth piece, no problem. But minimum is two. However, because we are in the state of ibadah now, the dress has to be the type of dress for salah. One important condition, just like salah, my dress should not become najis. So also the ihram two pieces should not become najis. The riwayah says, لا يلبسه حتى يغسل. Somebody said that I was resting and it became najis. Uh, I had a dream, a wet dream, and Imam says, no, don't continue wearing that dress. Must make sure you must purify it and then you wear it. So the requirement by the mushtahids is that the dress should be tahir. Yes, it can become dirty and dusty. That's not najis. It should not become najis. That is haram. Yes, mustahab to avoid colors which are dark. Recommended that it should be white dress. Mustahab that it should not be dirty to start with. But later on if it becomes dirty, no problem. In the state of ihram. Mustahab that it should be plain and not decorated the two pieces. Question. Why is it so important to, to wear these two types of dresses, the two pieces? In the uh, riwayah of Shibli, Imam salam gives us an indication. Imam salam asks Shibli, when you wore the dress, did you make the niyyah that you are removing from yourself the dress of nifaq, hypocrisy, and shubha, and... Uh, doubtful doubtful lifestyle options so Shibli said no so Imam said therefore you have not gotten the spirit of the dress dress apparently human beings uh, develop a wrong attitude about it dress basically should cover our shame it should give us protection from the weather it should be something comfortable. It should make us presentable in society. And in case, if in a society there's a particular status of a profession, so there are different types of dresses for different professions. But beyond that, when fashion comes in, and now showing off and hypocrisy comes in, there's a false class being created in society because of dress. So Imam alayhi salam says, no, be careful. <laughs> Look at this saying by Benjamin Franklin. He says, you can eat to please thyself, but you should dress to please others. Yes and no. Please others become presentable. But please others just because there's a fashion trend, and though I don't find it decent and modest and chaste, yet I wear it. No, this is haram. Others say the fashion industry, dress to impress, dress to express. So whatever I feel is right 
and uh, fashionable according to me, I can wear. This is the freedom which is bringing about sinfulness. Or they say that, you know, you want to project your personality and who you are. The three things you should do is the type of dress you wear and the hairstyle you have and the makeup that you apply. All artificial hypocrisy, which the ihram is teaching us to avoid. So they advise you, they say, the value of a person is not the dress which he or she wears. The value of the person is the person himself. So what's, what's the use of having a person wearing a beautiful dress? There's a nasty, rude, impolite person you wouldn't like to be in the company of. Whereas compared to another one, simple dress, but very helpful, very contributing, very honest and hardworking. So Imam alayhi salam, Sajjad, tells Shibli, Shibli, did you travel from Medina to go to the Miqat, Masjid Shajara? And once you reach there, did you remove your stitch dressing? And once you uh, were ready, did you remove the excess hair from your body? And then did you perform the mustahab ghusl in the Miqat? And Shibli said, yes. And then Imam asks him, but by going to Miqat, did you make the niyyah that خَلَعْتَ ثَوْبَ مَعْصِيَةً وَلَبَسْتَ ثَوْبَ الطَّاعَةً That you're making this journey now a journey of obedience from disobedience. When you removed your clothing, did you make the niyyah that تَجَرَّدْتَ مِنَ الْرِيَاءِ وَالشُبْهَ وَالنِّفَاقَ And when you shaved the excess hair from your body, uh, I'm referring to the armpits and the pubic area, I'm not referring to the hair for the gents to have to let the hair grow is mustahab for the gents to the trim trim the beard and trim the mustache is mustahab but not to cut and shave did you make the niyyah when you were removing the excess hair from your body that just like you took the blade to uh, remove the excess hair from your body that you will you will you use the blade of tawbah to, to, to cut off the excess sins that have grown on your body, your body, your hands, your, your, your legs, your eyes, your ears. There is sinfulness in these parts of the body. With the blade of tawbah, did you make the determination that I'm cutting off and repenting and asking sincere forgiveness from God and crying to God that He should accept me before I begin this journey. And after that, did you, as you perform the ghusl, did you make the niyyah that ghasalta min al that you not only washed your outer body, but you also washed your inner soul from sins. So part one of ihram, entering into the state of ihram, is to wear the right dress and to remove the stitched dress. Part two, uh, sorry, I've written Abiyar Ali because one of the names of uh, Masjid Shajara later on was Abiyar Ali. Presumably Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi, one of the functions he did was he would dig wells. Um, hundreds of wells have been attributed to him. And the interesting thing about Imam alayhi salam was that once he dug the well, he made it waqf fi sabilillah for public use. So in Abi Ar Ali Masjid Shajara, the second act of entering into the ihram, once I have worn the dress, now I have to make the niyyah. Why am I wearing this ihram? For what purpose? In the niyyah, most important thing is I am wearing this ihram to attain the pleasure of Allah, to obey the command of Allah, the all loving God, which is good for me, the all wise Lord, which is wisdom for me, the all. <coughs> punishing powerful Lord if I disobey he can question me on the day of judgment for willfully ignoring his wise loving compassionate command which ended up hurting myself so in order to please Allah and to gain proximity to Allah not for the sake of showing to others if it's done with Riyah then it is wajib to repeat the Niyyah When should the niyyah be made? Not now sitting here preparing for Hajj. 
not in Medina, the niyyah for the ihram should be done when we are at the miqat. When do you make the niyyah for salah? When you're at home before dhuhr? When you're in the masjid before the adhan? Or when you make the niyyah of salah at the time when you start your salah? Likewise, ihram, the niyyah should be made at the time when you wish to enter into the state of ihram. I want to pray four rak'ah. Qurbatan ila Allah. Allahu Akbar. Uh, excuse me, four rak'ah. Four rak'ah, wait. Zuhur, Asr, Isha. Oh, there are different salah. Oh, let me specify. When a single act can apply to three different types, then you have to specify which act are you doing. Ihram could be for Umrah or could be for Hajj. Which Ihram are you entering into? Uh, I want to go for Hajj. Yeah, but Hajj is even two types. There's Hajj Ifrad and there's Hajj Tamattu'ah. Which one is your Hajj? And even after, you, after you've decided the type of Hajj or the type of Umrah, are you doing this, your Hajj for yourself or you have been sponsored by someone? So you're doing it on behalf of that someone, Niyaba. And is it a Wajib Hajj you're doing for yourself or a Mustahab Hajj? Or no, sometimes it's an ihtiyat hajj. Ihtiyat hajj is somebody has already done hajj before. Many, many years ago. Or no, recently. But for some reason, he now realizes that there may be things he may have done or she may have done which were not right in that hajj. So now they're unsure. Was that hajj correct and therefore accepted or no? Sit with an alim. Go through the procedure. If you can uh, assure and ascertain that yes, the procedure was correct. Maybe you skipped some mustahabbat, maybe you did some makruhat, maybe you made some mistakes for which there's a minor penalty or a major penalty to be paid. That hajj is sahih, provided you compensate for it. But no, when you sit with the alim or when you hear from the alim and you go through the masail, you say, no, I, I strongly suspect that hajj was not sahih. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure. No problem. Ihtiyat as a precaution, redo the hajj. You make the niyyah, oh Allah, I don't know, I'm not sure right now. That hajj was a sahih or not? I'm doing this as ihtiyat. If that hajj is sahih in your knowledge and you know everything, then let this hajj be counted as a mustahab hajj. But if in your knowledge and you know everything, oh Lord, that hajj was actually Batil, then let this be the wajib hajj. Qurbatan ila Allah, and you enter into ihram. So instead of saying all these long sentences that I've just described, you just say, I'm making an ihtiyat hajj. Amma fi dhimma hajj. So the niyyah has to be clear. How do you make the niyyah? Well, just like salah, before you start salah, you don't say, I am now going to pray. Of Isha, Qurbatan ila Allah, and then you say Allahu Akbar. You don't have to say it loudly, it's not required. You can do it internally in your mind, you can recite the niyyah. No, even in the mind, you don't need to recite the niyyah. If somebody asks you, Samahani, uh, what are you praying now? Oh, I'm praying uh, four rakah salah. Which salah four rakah? Isha. Why? Well, it's for myself, not uh, niyaba for somebody who has died and they need a compensation. It's for yourself. Uh, is it uh, you're doing a second time because your first salat al Isha, you're not sure? No, 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 it's my first time. It's not ihtiyat. So you know everything, though you may not have spoken, though you may not have recited in your mind, but you know what you're doing. You're aware, you're conscious, you're attentive. That's enough. The niya is ready. Lakini. Mustahab to pronounce the niya. How to do so? I will mention. And of course, uh, it is important at the time of the niya also to 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 make the general niya that I'm going to. Therefore, now once I enter into ihram, to avoid everything which is haram in ihram, and I'm going to carry out all the wajibat of the hajj or the umrah. You should have this in your mind. But just like salah, you don't say, I'm now going to pray salah. And in the state of salah, I will be in the ihram. And in the ihram, I will not look right and left. And I will not smile and laugh. 
and I will not talk. No, you don't have to say all these things. But generally you know, in salah, I will not do anything which is haram in salah. Likewise for ihram, anything which is restricted in ihram, I will avoid. Everything which is wajib in, in, in the ihram of hajj, I will perform. So I want to do the mustahab niya. Not in my mind. Loudly I want to recite. So what should I say? So you should say, I'm now entering into the state of ihram. For the sake of umrah to tamattu' which is part of my wajib hajjatul islam first time or no i've already done first time which is part of my mustahab hajj no 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 it's not mustahab it's my ihtiyat hajj or ma fi dhimma hajj or no god forbid i had a previous hajj i purposely did something which breaks and invalidates the hajj as a penalty and a punishment i must do this second hajj so specify and this hajj is i uh, for myself the umrah to tamattu as part of a hajj is for myself or no on behalf of my sponsor uh, niyaba for him or her or no i i'm not being paid to do this hajj for niyaba i am gifted i've been gifted to do this hajj or no i want to give as a gift I want to do this hajj for the sake of marhum, so and so, qurbatan ilallah, in obedience to God's command, in order to win his reward and pleasure, in order to avoid the punishment of willfully disobeying him. Question. So niya is wajib, but, and to pronounce is mustahab, but what is the spiritual aspect of making the niya? Shibli was asked by Imam Sajjad salam. So you went to Miqat. Did you make the niyyah? He said, yes. Did you enter into the state of ihram? Yes. So Imam said, when you make the niyyah that I'm entering into ihram, هَلْ نَوَيْتَ أَنَّكَ قَدْ حَلَّلْتَ كُلَّ عَقْدٍ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ That now you will be under the obligation of obeying God and God alone. Any other contractual obligation that you may have with anybody else is now suspended your priority is now God and God alone did you make that niyyah and when you entered into the state of ihram did you make the niyyah that just like I'm going to make on myself haram these 26 items in the state of ihram 26 is an example but for the rest of my life just like this journey is a journey to meet God I have a longer journey to meet God in Akhirah. For that longer journey, I will avoid all the other haram acts which God has pro prohibited. Haram ta'ala nafsik kulla muharram. There are some acts which are mustahab in ihram, as I pointed out. For example, the removal of excess hair and the making of ghusl and the prayers. So let me go through the whole list. Mustahab to trim the excess hair, trim the nails, mustahab to do the ghusl. Mustahab to go into the state of ihram to the miqat at the dhuhr time of prayer. Because the Holy Prophet went at that time. Or no, if you can't, then any, any other time of wajib prayer. Maybe fajr, maybe maghrib. Or no, if it's not any other time, then go and pray salah, which is qaza salah, wajib salah. Or no, you've got all your wajib and qaza ready. So at least, mustahab to pray two rak'ah. Mustahab to pray six rak'ah, two, two, three times. Salatul ihram. Or no, at least two rak'ah, salatul ihram, in the miqat. And mustahab in this salah not to recite any surah, mustahab to recite after Fatiha in the first rak'ah, surah Ikhlas, and in the second rak'ah, surah Al-Kafirun after Fatiha. Mustahab also there's a dua, you will notice that you've been given a book of Adab al haramain which has the mustahab duas to be recited when you pronounce the niyyah and you wear the dress of the ihram. Mustahab, that you wear a cotton dress ihram, and then the talbiyah, the mustahab of talbiyah I'll mention later on. There's something which is a makruh in the state of ihram. Makruh to wear a black ihram. Mustahab that the ihram that you wear is la yuhrim fi thawb al-aswad wa la yukfan bihi al-mayyit. Just like the mayyit, mustahab, 
not wajib, mustab to be given three pieces of white dress. Incidentally, the mayyit also wears the same. He's got a loin cloth from the navel to the knee. He's got a shoulder cloth from the shoulder down till a little below the knee, the qamis, um, uh, the robe. The, so you've got the lower dress, the skirt or the lower garment and you've got the upper uh, dress and then finally you've got one third piece of kafan which covers from above the head to below the feet. That is mustab, it should be white. So also the ihram should be white. Makru that it should be black. Makru that it should be dirty. Makru it should be decorated. Makru to apply hina before miqat. Especially hina itself may be mustahab. But makru if the effect and the color of hina is going to remain till the time of entering into ihram. Makru to bathe, to take a bath, not a ghusl. Ghusl is mustahab. To take an ordinary bath in the state of ihram. But if somebody wants to do it, it's allowed. However, try to avoid massaging the body because that will cause hair fall, which is haram in the state of ihram. Try to avoid brushing teeth. Brushing teeth is mustahab, but excessive may cause bleeding. Makru. Try to avoid to do anything which will cause hair fall. For example, scrubbing the face. Makru in the state of ihram to use a pillow to rest which is yellow in color or a bed cover which is yellow. Makru to recite poetry. We'll come to this because they are related to the talbiyah. So, did you enter Shibli? Imam Sajjad salam asks Shibli, did you enter Miqat? And did you pray the two raka'ah salah? And when you entered the miqat, the masjid now, did you enter with the niyyah, the annaka bi niyyati ziyara? Now you are preparing for the ziyara to come into the presence of God in Masjid al-Haram around the Kaaba. That is your goal, but preparation is 400 kilometers away. So don't enter into masjid as a ritual. Everybody's doing it, I'm doing it. No, internally you should know this is a preparation for that final goal. Therefore, from now till then, I have to be in the state of gradual preparation and self-discipline. And did you pray the two rak'ah? I said, why is mustahab? Did you pray those mustahab two rak'ah salah of ihram? Yes. But did you make the niyyah taqarrabta ilallahi bi khayril a'mal? Also, you have made the niyyah that in the state of ihram, I will avoid all that is haram and I will do everything that pleases God. Okay, so what pleases God? One of the best things that pleases God, salah. Did you start with salah? Did it cross your mind to pray salah? Therefore, you are already thinking that I am now in a state and a mode where I want to do everything which pleases God and brings me close to God. And finally, after the dress of ihram has been worn and after the niyyah has been made, you are still not in ihram. I've come to the masjid, I've made the wudu, my dress is sahih for salah, I'm standing, I have made the niyyah, I'm praying salah, but I've not made the takbiratul ihram, I'm not in salah as yet. To enter into salah and to enter into ihram, we must pronounce the talbiyah. So what are the rules about talbiyah? Talbiyah has a wajib part and a mustahab part. There are four labbaik. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. These four labbaik are wajib to enter into the state of ihram. But mustahab to add something more. In alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika laka labbaik. This is an extra mustahab but not wajib. But wajib for the pronunciation to be correct. And that's why this exercise or the daily practice that 
if we can't pronounce it correctly, we must learn to pronounce it correctly. Not only the labbaik, but also the salah, the fatiha and the surah, and the wajib dhikr. I tried as much as I can, but I can't. No problem. Then that is something beyond your control. Allah will forgive you. Do as much as you can. I can't. I can't. The little that I can is so complicated that no Arabic speaking person listening to me can appreciate what I'm saying. No problem. In that situation, you can recite whatever wrong recitation you can make, but also make the translation and also give niyaba to someone on your behalf that they should recite the talbiya for you. Tahara, at the time of reciting the talbiya, is it wajib? No, no, not wajib. That means without wudu, without ghusl, I can be in Masjid Shajara and say labbaik Allahumma labbaik and it is sahih. Of course, not in the state of Janaba because it's haram to enter the masjid in that state. But no, no wudu, no mustahab ghusl. I just enter the masjid, labbaik Allahumma labbaik and I'm out. No problem, allowed to do so. But definitely mustahab to be in the state of tahara, of ghusl. The rules of Talbiyah also say that there is a specific place where you start and a specific place where you stop reciting the Talbiyah. The place to start the Talbiyah, wajib, once in the Masjid Shajara, Dhul Hulayfa, the Miqat. But Mustahab, also to repeat it a second time, once you come out of the Masjid, the Miqat, and you enter the uh, wide open desert and begin your journey from Medina to Mecca, you reach a place known as Bayda, the open uh, space, Mustahab, to repeat the Talbiyah there. <coughs> And mustahab then to repeat again and again this talbiya all the way till Mecca. So mustahab when you are boarding the bus, mustahab when you stop in between and disembarking from the bus, mustahab when you meet another person, mustahab when uh, at night you are beginning to rest, mustahab the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning to repeat the talbiya. Lakini, once you reach Mecca, you stop the Talbiyah. So mustahab to repeat the Talbiyah after that once wajib. Talbiyah can be repeated several times, several ways. One way is just said labbaik, labbaik, the simplest repetition. Or no, the longer one will be Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharik laka labbaik Repetition of this four labbaiks Or no, there's a longer one than that Labbaik dhal ma'ariji labbaik It's a long dua, maybe about 10, 12 times you repeat labbaik with different dhikr Mustahab, all these are mustahabbat Mustahab to repeat when you're embarking on the bus, disembarking, when the bus is Nowadays, the roads have been constructed such that they're all through uh, flat land. In the past, the caravan routes may have to head past hills and valleys, and therefore the riwayah says is mustahab when you're ascending a hill or when you're descending into the valley, mustahab to recite the talbiyah. Mustahab to repeat the talbiyah after every wajib prayer, faridah prayer. Mustahab when you meet another caravan, Mustahab to recite the Talbiyah at night as you go to sleep. Mustahab to recite the Talbiyah before Fajr in the time of Sahar. Even, no problem, if you're in the state of Janaba or the woman is in the state of her monthly flow. And obviously you stop at the time when you reach Mecca. Question, what is the spiritual aspect of reciting the Talbiyah? Imam Sajjad asks Shibli, when you were in the Miqat, did you recite the Talbiyah? And he said, yes. But did you make the niyyah that نَطَقْتَ لِلَّهِ بِكُلِّ طَاعَةٍ وَصُمْتَ عَنْ كُلِّ مَعْصِيَةٍ Labbaik means, yes my master, yes my master. Allahumma labbaik, because you are Allah, the all perfect being, who alone deserves to be obeyed and worshipped and thanked and remembered and praised and prayed to. 
and hoped in and feared from. Did you make that niyyah that from now onwards your tongue will only speak yes my true master. That means no yes to other people especially if those other people will ask you to do things against God's command. Did you make that niyyah? So essentially this labbaik is a life changing commitment and a determination not to commit any sins by our eyes or ears or tongue or any other parts of the body because now we are in the presence of God and going to the higher presence of God and therefore we should not disrespect in the presence of God here I am saying oh Lord I'm your slave and then I forget God and start obeying others basically the whole message of Talbiya is my whole lifetime I may have been heedless and mindless and negligent of God I may have been saying yes to the to the glitter of the dunya the haram glitter to the commands by other people to dictators and evil evil systems or what do I do the education system and the cultural system and the media and the uh, political system is not according to God's command what do I do uh oh what do you do you, there's a duty for every situation from now on labbaik Allahumma labbaik in all aspects of my life or sometimes people are strong and smart but they follow that inner little God inside oh no they follow the devil so labbaik yes to God and la labbaik to any power or entity other than God and not only once but several times throughout from the Miqat till Mecca meaning this whole trip meaning my whole journey of life also I will always be saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik I give you a practical application there's a young man on one of the past trips of Hajj the mother came to me Shaykh my son I'm telling him not to listen to music but he listens can you please advise him so I say, young man, don't you know what is music is haram? He says, yeah, but you know everybody else and you know it's so attractive and um, inshallah I will try to avoid. I said, listen, this whole trip of Hajj, what did you say? Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. So when the temptation comes from music, just remind yourself, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did not clarify one thing. It is mustahab to pronounce the talbiya loudly. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. With all my energy, I am committing myself to say yes to you and you alone. The sahaba, they say with the prophet, we recited so loudly again and again till our voices became hoarse. With all my energy, my tongue is saying, with all my energy, my eyes and my ears and my limbs, my whole being, just like the rest of the creation, the sun, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, the moon, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, the earth, the sea, the plants, the animals, every particle of my body, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, lakini this nafs, nafs is saying, la labbaik, well, I have to train this little nafs to harmonize, to coordinate, to mobilize itself and become one with the rest of the creation and say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik throughout this journey. And the effect will be yes, the person will change in their mind, in their thinking, in their habits, and in their lifestyles, inshallah. Let's pray to Allah for tawfiq. If there's any question or clarification, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Oh, yes. The moment you arrive in the airport, there it's being sold there in the markets in Medina. In case if you go to Medina first, or in case you wish to go to Makkah straight away from Jeddah, in the Jeddah airport, you can get uh, the unstitched. Uh, thanks to the Chinese. <laughs> yes, please. 
Okay, I will, uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, I should have mentioned it here, but later on, we will discuss the restrictions of the state of ihram. Is there any exception to wear a stitched clothing? I will discuss the belt issue there uh, in the restrictions of the ihram, inshallah. The ladies? Oh, yes, yes, wajib once. But loudly, no. Yes, please. Yes, mustahab, but of course, as we go along, I will repeat them again. But the problem is <clears throat> the journey from the Miqat to Mecca is going to be a one straight journey, no stops in between. There will be one stop, but it will just be for the sake of convenience and resting around midnight. Or incidentally, the practical planning is this, that the caravans prefer to go to Miqat at the wajib time prayer of Maghrib. So just before sunset, we will proceed uh, on the Asr of the day when we are planning to go to the Miqat. We will leave for the Miqat, arrive around sunset time, prepare ourselves at the time of Maghrib, pray Salatul Maghrib, the wajib prayer, and then uh, enter into Ihram. Uh, Preferably the ghusl should be done at the Miqat in Masjid Shajara, but so many caravans come there. There are facilities, but they may not be enough. And therefore we end up wasting time. Well, wasting time meaning that we end up spending a lot of hours in order to cut down the number of hours. Just for the sake of convenience, the hujjaj will be told that do the ghusl at home in Medina and not in the Miqat. Must have to do it in Miqat, but for convenience we are allowed to do it before one. This is the ghusl of the entering into Ihram. As we leave the Ihram, we embark on the bus. The time we reach the Haram, the Haram border for Mecca is Masjid Tan'im when we're coming from Medina. Must have to stop there, get off the bus, make a dua, make another ghusl, the ghusl of now entering into the Haram. And then, once we cross the Haram, we enter into the city of uh, Mecca, there's another ghusl. Lakini, what has happened now is, old Mecca has expanded in such a way that it has now crossed the Masjid Tan'im and gone beyond Masjid Tan'im now. So, <laughs> there'll be no other stops on the way. And then there's a fourth ghusl that we need to do uh, when we want to enter Masjid Al-Haram. And then there's a fifth ghusl that is mustahab to do for the sake of tawaf because of convenience, simply because of convenience. We therefore remind the hujjaj, do all these five ghusl niya, only one ghusl in action, but the niya will be for five ghusl in the hotel in Medina. Lakini, if you want to do more mustahab ghusls, so you do three niya in the building in Medina. Ghusl of Ihram, Ghusl of the Haram entry, and Ghusl from Makkah entry. But once you reach Makkah and you have settled in your building, before you go to Masjid al Haram for the Tawaf, in the building in Makkah you can do another Ghusl with the two niya, one for Masjid al Haram and one for the Tawaf. You can you can have extra Ghusls in that way. No problem. You are allowed to take off the Ihram. When you visit the washroom, you can take all, all over off the loincloth. When you visit the bath uh, for ghusl, you can take off the uh, shoulder cloth, no problem. The question from the lady side, can my first hajj be a niyaba hajj of somebody else? According to some mushtahids, yes, you're allowed to, no problem. Because it is not wajib on you. And the big question is, can a person who has never performed any hajj in his or her lifetime, can they be selected as an uh, agent and a naib to perform hajj on behalf of some deceased person or some diseased person who, who has the money but doesn't have the health to go and do hajj in their lifetime? The answer is yes, no problem. If it's not wajib on you that year, by your own funds, and the money which has been given to you is not for you to do your hajj, it's been given to you to do somebody else's hajj, then yes, you're allowed to do it. Sorry, I was given uh, some other questions, but you will 
uh, allow me to respond to them later on because they refer to the other rituals. There's one about uh, stoning and there's one about Hijr Ismail and there's one about Masah. Oh, the Masah I can answer. How should do one, one do Masah if the water dries out due to hot weather? I have not experienced in hot weather that the water dries out. What you need to do is take extra water when you're washing the wajib wash of the face, the wajib wash of the hands. If there's extra water flowing, it should not dry out. Unless your wudu is so prolonged, it should not be that prolonged, that it should dry out. There is a question about the Salatul Jama'ah. If we are going to pray Salah in the Masjid, do we pray with the knee of Jama'ah or Furada? No, you pray with the knee of Jama'ah. Sallu fi masajidihim. The Imams السلام, have instructed go and pray in the mosques uh, of the Muslim brothers and therefore pray in Jama'ah, not with the knee of Furada. And in Jama'ah, if you say yes to Jama'ah, then what about the recitation of Surah Fatiha in Ikhlas? Yeah, no problem. Like I said, different madhahib, different madhabs, they themselves require. In Jama'ah, that the Ma'amum should also recite the Fatiha. After the Imam completes Fatiha, the Ma'amum should recite Fatiha as the Imam is reciting the second surah. But we say, no, you can recite Fatiha even as the Imam is reciting Fatiha. You can recite the other surah even as the Imam is reciting the other surah. There are other questions as an appropriate as we go ahead, I will respond to them, inshallah. Let's pray to Allah for tawfiq to be able to enter into that mental preparation for hajj and therefore begin to get the thawab even from now. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.